Today, we're going to go in depth on how to reduce the risk of positional vertigo or benign paroxysmal positional vertigo. This is a common problem and a frustration for a lot of people. And in fact, it's a problem that could strike you or anyone you love at any time, especially if you're over the age of 35. While the condition is called benign vertigo, this condition can cause everything from being a minor annoyance uh, with the symptoms to completely upending someone's life and changing even the trajectory of their life, no matter what age you are. In older people, positional vertigo is a common cause of falls and declines, so this is a condition is definitely not benign. So today we're going to talk about how to prevent this common problem that's actually relatively unknown. I'll give you the most powerful ways to reduce the risk of BPPV based on the science. Then we will take a deep dive into the evidence so you can see where this information is coming from and how valid it is. We also touch base a bit about what the science says about preventing positional vertigo from coming back so we can talk about some of the patterns overall in the research so we can look at this overall topic of positional vertigo prevention. Hi, I'm Dr. Jeffrey Guild, physical therapist, the founder of Optimove. We provide information for people suffering with dizziness, balance and fall problems, mobility with aging issues, and so much more to help people be more active and independent in their homes and community. If you like content like this, hit subscribe to the channel so you can get more information like this. Positional vertigo or benign paroxysmal positional vertigo is a common problem people face but may not know much about until they or someone they know suffers from it. It's a condition where calcium carbonate crystals in the inner ear balance system dislodge from where they should be and get into a place where they should not. So to put it simply, the symptoms can range from rotational spinning and dizziness to just dizziness, unsteadiness, lightheadedness, and a whole host of symptoms. This condition can be annoying and interfere with your ability to exercise or work. At worst, can even increase the risk of falls and injury and leave people completely debilitated. So you may wonder then, are there associated factors for this condition and how strong is the evidence for these factors? And in fact, is there evidence on this? And that is what we're going to talk about today to give you actionable things that you can do to potentially reduce the risk of positional vertigo. If you are a healthcare provider and you are wanting to give good information to your patients or clients about the things they can do to reduce the risk of positional vertigo. What you really want to know is what does the evidence tell you and how strong is that evidence? And especially if you are a physician or a mid-level, this information will give you additional actionable items with your patients since a lot of these causes are things that you address with them all the time. And no matter what type of healthcare provider you are, these are powerful points of patient information that you can use to reduce the risk of your patients getting positional vertigo, and again, only with the highest quality evidence as of the date of this recording. The most common and actionable themes throughout the research to prevent positional vertigo are make sure that your vitamin D levels are normal and treat it with your doctor if it is not. Be proactive with your doctor about screening for your bone density and treat and reduce the risk of bone density problems as much as you can. Keep your total cholesterol low since this is a risk factor according to the research and treat balance problems because head injuries and trauma to the head and neck, especially due to falls, also increase the risk of positional vertigo. And so don't blow off the warning signs of balance problems and falls. See a physical therapist if you have a balance problem and make sure that you get this treated early and exercise and walk on a regular basis. If you have migraines, be proactive with your neurologist so that you can stay well medically managed with your migraine condition. Okay, so those are the most actionable things that you can do as someone suffering from positional vertigo, or if you are a healthcare provider and you want to give your patients actionable things that they can do to prevent positional vertigo from happening. So where does all this information come from? And what is the quality of the evidence as of the recording in March of 2024? Up to this point, there there has been one major systematic review and meta-analysis that has looked at this question. This study was published in Frontiers of Neurology in 2020. And what the researchers did was they compiled all the evidence together from 19 studies and over 14,000 participants. And from these 19 studies, they statistically pooled 
all the data together. And this is the meta-analysis portion of the study. And they were able to draw conclusions based on all the studies together. Now, it is important to mention that these studies are associated factors, meaning they are correlations, but that does not necessarily mean that these cause positional vertigo. But by establishing correlations and risk factors, we can begin to establish some actionable things that you can do to reduce the risk of positional vertigo. Now, interestingly, there are many risk factors that were not associated with positional vertigo, and some of them controversial. These factors not associated with positional vertigo, according to this meta-analysis, including age, osteopenia, stroke, hypertension, diabetes, hyperlipidemia, smoking, drinking, alcohol, and physical inactivity. I will also mention being female has commonly been thought of as a risk factor and was a risk factor in this meta-analysis, although just slightly. And I have seen other studies where there is not a difference between men and women. From what I can tell, the reason for these discrepancies may be how much age is factored in because the difference between the genders increases after menopause. So according to several studies, older women appear to be more susceptible to positional vertigo. Now, incidence and prevalence is far greater with women than men overall and that's important to know and that's we know that for sure now age is interesting here and it is commonly thought that positional vertigo strikes older people more so than younger adults the reason for age not being a risk factor in this study according to the authors may be because of how much all of these studies together control for age between those who had positional vertigo versus the control groups. So more research definitely needs to be done analyzing both gender and age as risk factors for positional vertigo. Now, before I dig into this further, I will say that the amount of research about risk factors for the cause of positional vertigo is a lot less than the research on the recurrence of positional vertigo, which means the rate at which positional vertigo returns once treated successfully by a healthcare provider. There's actually a lot of evidence about positional vertigo coming back and if you want to hear about the risk factors associated with positional vertigo returning, you go to the link in our show notes to get the full episode where we take a deep dive on that topic and go over the evidence on that topic. Now let's start talking about the tip of supplementing vitamin D and preventing bone density problems. So you may be wondering what the vestibular system or the inner ear balance system has with vitamin D and bone density. So the crystals that get dislodged in our inner ear balance system and go to a place where they should not be are made out of calcium carbonate. So the physiology of these crystals called otoconia are very similar to the physiology of our bone density in general. Now, in case you're wondering why you have rocks in your head and not for the reasons that your family is telling you, it's because the rocks in your head tell your brain about acceleration and where your head is in space. So vitamin D helps with the absorption of calcium in our bodies to help our bones be stronger. So the theme we see all throughout the research about positional vertigo is if the bone density system is weak, the risk of positional vertigo goes up. Many of these studies go into the specific mechanisms of the vestibular system, the otoconia, and how vitamin D, estrogen, and bone density all connect. So if you're interested in that level of detail, we have referenced the studies that we are talking about here in the show notes. Bone density being associated with getting positional vertigo is highly studied, including, for instance, its own independent systematic review that was published in Biomed Central Neurology in 2014, which supports the, this finding and however with low to medium quality evidence. So the big 2020 meta-analysis that we're mainly talking about, there was good consistency across the studies to support that connection between vitamin D and getting positional vertigo in the first place. Now, this main 2020 study interestingly found that osteoporosis was also a risk factor as well, but not osteopenia. Now, looking at vitamin D is worth mentioning a whole other systematic review and meta-analysis from 2018 published in the European Archives of Otorhinolaryngology did not find an association with vitamin D and getting positional vertigo. So there is mixed information on this in the research and the research itself needs stronger studies to determine this. However, osteoporosis appears to be a more valid risk factor for positional vertigo without conflicting studies. High cholesterol 
cholesterol being a risk factor is interesting since hyperlipidemia is not a risk factor in this main 2020 systematic review. So the difference between these two markers is total cholesterol does not factor in triglycerides, whereas hyperlipidemia does factor in triglycerides. So this is interesting since both are cardiovascular markers that could have an effect on the vascularity of the inner ear balance system. This is obviously an area that needs to be studied further. And it's worth mentioning that one of the big takeaways from our analysis about positional vertigo coming back was the strong association with cardiovascular risk factors. And it's interesting that these risk factors do not appear to be associated with getting positional vertigo in the first place. These other cardiovascular risk factors that are, according to the study, not associated with getting positional vertigo include hypertension, diabetes, stroke, and hyperlipidemia. So needless to say, a lot more research needs to be done on this topic. Now, head trauma was significantly associated with positional vertigo and the groups were consistent across two studies. Now amongst vestibular specialists, we are very familiar with the increased risk of positional vertigo after a head injury, and especially for an older person such as after a fall. So this finding is not a surprise to us. Head injury was also a risk factor for vertigo coming back once treated successfully. So this is a common theme throughout both of these topics. Now I'm going to take this opportunity to introduce a really interesting study that was published in 2021. And this was a prospective observational study of 117 people. And what the researchers did was they took people who were diagnosed with head injuries with various severities in two different emergency departments and tracked them over 12 weeks to see if and when they got positional vertigo. And if the patient got positional vertigo, they brought them in tested and treated them. So this is the first time a study has measured the length of time it takes for people to get positional vertigo after a head injury. And a bunch of insights were discovered. To keep it simple, I'll go over the main point. And again, if you want to read the whole study, its link is in the show notes. So what the researchers found was, of course, a much greater risk of getting positional vertigo after any severity of head injury, regardless of age or gender. And this risk went up with more severe head injuries. And nearly all of the cases occurred within the first two weeks after the injury. What's additionally interesting, as a clinical vestibular specialist, there was more involvement with the horizontal canals, anterior canals, and more than one canal being involved compared to if the positional vertigo would have happened without trauma. This piece of information gives us very practical information for clinicians. And for non-vestibular specialists, this basically means that the cases get theoretically more involved and more complicated as more areas of the vestibular system are affected and more has to be treated. Now, as far as migraines, someone having migraines is associated with positional vertigo. And in general, if you have been diagnosed with migraines, it is best to make sure that the migraines are well medically managed and the best thing that you can do is be aware of the increased risk of positional vertigo occurring and to make sure that you have your migraines under control as much as possible. And if you have been diagnosed with migraines, having a go-to vestibular specialist to treat the positional vertigo if and when it arises could be very helpful in the event you get positional vertigo because the attacks of positional vertigo tend to come suddenly and without warning. Okay, so we have covered a lot of information about possible associated factors for positional vertigo happening in the first place. And like I mentioned earlier, there's a lot more and higher quality research about positional vertigo coming back once it's treated properly. If you wanna see that full analysis, go to our YouTube channel or find the link in the show notes to get that full analysis. So what are the common themes when researchers look at the risk factors of positional vertigo basically overall? Although some of these associated factors still need to be studied, the common themes appeared to be bone health, vitamin D levels, cardiovascular risk factors, head and neck trauma, and the diagnosis of migraine. Now, I'm purposely leaving age and gender out of this sense, maybe surprisingly to a lot of clinicians and myself included, the research still appears a little all over the place on this and seems to depend on all of these other variables, which are associated with age. But is age by itself a risk factor. A lot of these studies control for age, so that can complicate the findings. Now, one last topic to cover, and that is looking at different biomarkers as risk factors for positional vertigo. This research is still in the early stages, and what scientists are looking at is a glycoprotein called 
otolin-1, which has been found to increase with people with positional vertigo. Otolin-1 is an inner ear specific protein which provides a kind of scaffolding to the crystals basically the otoconia, which tend to get dislodged and cause positional vertigo. So basically this otolin-1 protein appears to increase with degeneration of the otoconia, but the actual mechanism is unknown. But according to a 2022 meta-analysis published in Frontiers Neurology, otolin-1 levels were elevated in people with positional vertigo, making otolin-1 a possible form of diagnosing or predicting the risk of positional vertigo. The research for this is in the early stages, but something to keep your eye on if you are interested in the topic of positional vertigo. So to summarize, if you're interested in reducing your risk of positional vertigo, overall, optimize your bone density, your cardiovascular health, reduce the risk of falling and other trauma to your head and neck, and to keep migraines well managed if you have been diagnosed with migraines. If you are interested in more content like this, click the like and subscribe button so you can get more content like this. If you are interested in our previous episode about what the science says about preventing positional vertigo from coming back, the link is in the show notes. If you want to see the visuals of these studies we're talking about in this episode and the other episode, be sure to view this episode on YouTube or Facebook and you'll be able to see the visuals of the actual studies themselves. All the references covered today will be in the show notes. And in the meantime, thank you so much. And we're looking forward to providing more information out to you soon.